what I do, just in that aspect, uh, is define what I consider as, as an historic building, which is basically anything that was built before about 1945 or 1950 even. You know, it, it, it is an age which comes up quite, uh, you know, sort of a lot further than some people think. You tend to think about thatched cottages and Tudor mountains or whatever. Yeah, they're historic, but the basic construction terms and forms that you look at and materials that are being used didn't really change much until the uh, Second World War when <coughs> there was such a big gap in the construction industry, nothing took place for about the best part of 25 years. It was from, to be 1939 everything came to a stop and it didn't really get going and then until you know, the, the end of the 1950s. There was some development during the 50s, but not much. So there was that big gap. A lot of people went out of the industry, but during that time, things and construction forms changed. And, that, and they went on a lot further. And then you get another big jump in construction technology, or what was legislation which was driven by that, and that was the uh, national building regulations that came into force in 1966. Before then, you had local authority regulations varied from council to council and so it was really if you like the age of historic buildings comes on quite late but a lot of the problems we're going to see with in timber still runs through now you know on you know in, into modern buildings and so it's still sort of it's still going on it's the same basic problems uh, the first picture up here now as introduction one Standard joinery timber frame windows set into a refurbished building put up in about 1900, 1905, uh, central London. And here the problem is, as you say, damp. A lot of it, classic sort of wet rot and dry rot coming in around <coughs> the whole thing. You've got, uh, even on a building that age, you've got timber lintels over the windows. Yeah, fair enough, you've got brick arches at the front. Back into those, you've got, you've got timber lintels. This particular place was built just as solid wall construction, brick and a half thick, went on fine. Then in the 1960s, it was rendered over. Brickwork was on fast work, render it over, and you're sealing in damp immediately. You're stopping the walls breathing. Uh, that with general decay, gutters weren't being cleaned, running down the face of the wall, and you're getting problems like this coming into it. So it's a full sort of, um, sort of run on a building. Which, way, which one am I pressing? Yeah. That one? That's it. Okay. So what I'm looking at now is from the point of view of a, of, of a simple building survey. One who's in private practice, uh, going out doing surveys, also, you know, a lot of them are pre-purchase, we get a lot of inquiries from people coming in saying, I've got damp of some sort, what do I do about it, what's the cause? As most with, I think virtually all of you today, you're going to have one eye on your PI as to what the level of advice you're, you're giving, are you getting to the cause of it? And so, you know, so, and when people say, you're meeting the oh, you're also there, can you come around and have a look at this? I've got a problem. You know, so you try saying that to your GP if you met him in the pub, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and again, it's what we're just doing on the site. It's what you're allowed to do, what the clients are you know, accepted to do, what's intrusive, what isn't intrusive, and how much can you open up. It's going to be largely visual. It's going to be instinct, experience, uh, you know, and a, and a whole lot of other things. And you can read stuff that's churned out by the various bodies, Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings, Historic England, Historic Scotland, CAD or whatever. All, come, all these ways of diagnosing damp. You know, they've got all this fancy kit. I have it in my office. You know, so it's very much a case of that. And again, what is damp? How's it manifesting? You know, the whole aspect on that one. And within that, it's going to be an hour today, so, you know, that's it, you know, so you're not going to get very much from it. It gets some sort of general pointers. And uh, again, I'm limiting myself as to what we're going to find in the UK or the British Isles or whatever. 
And with all these things, that's something that's coming more and more frequent. I don't know if you're funny this on surveys. You go up to something, it looks a bit soft, and you prod it, the keys come out, you go into it, and it's solid. But it's basically, if someone's been down there, they've got the two-pack wood hardener, got some cardboard you fill out, and smeared it in, but it's still not looking right. And, uh, yeah, <coughs> so it's, it is that whole thing. And so, when you're looking at a lot of these things, when you look at timber decay and damp decay, damp is one aspect within timber. It's going to give you clues as to what you're looking at. Uh, and the various ways that you can look at. You've got wet rot, dry rot, and there can be confusion between the two of them because they can show us very similar symptoms in some circumstances. Uh, you don't always get the cuboid breakup, you don't always get the big fruiting bodies. You don't always have stuff which you put your finger in it comes out like a sort of piece of soggy sponge. There's all sorts of problems you can come into it. And so we tend to, unless we are sure with our reporting, we tend to avoid dry rot, wet rot, and yes, wet-related fungal decay. It looks better. <laughs> and then it's, you know, if you're seeing it, you're seeing something. So that's, that's the initial flag. Yeah, so you're highlighting it in there. So again, it's that eye on the PI again. It's uh, just uh, be a little bit careful there. Then uh, from that point of seeing, right, we've got some decay there. What's causing it? Try and chase that down. And then when you get to what you think is the cause of that damp, you can start to suggest a remedy. And what we're saying here is that if you, when you are seeing decay, that is a symptom. It isn't the problem. The problem is what's causing it. So don't get too fixated in that thing. You know, you, 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 it's all too easy to say, right, you've got some dry rot in a skirting board. To, get, to eradicate the dry rot, you have to do this. To eradicate the dry rot, you get to get right back in and find out what the cause, what the stem of that dry rot is. Otherwise, you're just removing that piece of timber that the dry rot has been quite happily feeding on for the last X, mo X months, years, or whatever, and you're going to replace it with a new lunch. So you've really got to get to, you know, to the end of it. And I said, so when we're looking at rot, I'm saying it's a, it's a generic term, wet rot particularly all sorts and all sorts of sorts of ways. Outward signs, yeah, the damp timber. You've got a roof leak, it's going to be damp. That can lead to rot. You can, have, can show up as localised dark staining. Uh, you can get some evidence of fungal growth, you know, mycelium growth or whatever on the timber, but not always. Yeah, but if it's been painted over and you can't rip a skirting board off in the middle of a home buyer survey and they tend not to like it. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things that you've taken a judgment on what you see. You've got some aspects here, you've got yeah, an obvious piece of decay, it's now dry, it's dried out, but it's been there. If you're seeing that, when you've got poor ventilation in this aspect, that's a little bit more obvious. But that piece in here, an old valley board, it's been repaired, you haven't got a leak net, but you still had wet rot in there. And, you know, the general effect, you'll probably all know, when it's wet, it's wet. It's spongy, it's soggy. You can get an odour off it at times. Once it's dried out, it becomes friable. It can be friable when it's wet. It usually come, tends to go off in long fibres, which again <coughs> differentiate from if, if you're finding wet rot. And, but as I said, in some circumstances it can be confused with dry rot or vice versa in this whole aspect. Causes, as I was just saying, free water, water entry into place, leaks, roof leaks, all sorts of things. Coming into the walls, coming through 
uh, under the floorboards or whatever. High humidity levels <coughs> tend to be an aspect which can be ignored. You know, in closed spaces where you're, you know, you, you've got a lot of high humidity. Kitchens, bathrooms where windows aren't being opened on a regular basis can cause saturation of the fabric. It can be in a roof space. Classic example for that, and we're coming to see it in a minute, is where someone's tucked the insulation hard into the eaves, you've got bituminous type roofing felt. Moisture goes up into the roof space, condenses, and you've got free water and high humidity. It's the sort of day when you go off and do a survey. It's a cold, muggy day, and I've come across it before. You're walking around the house, not so much now, but they've got the Kayla heaters on. They're drying the nappies over the top of that. And, the whole, and it's that, those sort of February misty, murky days outside. You know, it's not just above freezing and that sort of thing. And so you go in, the whole house feels warm and muggy, like walking into a sauna. You can go up through into the roof space, open the roof hatch, and you'll get rained on. Because it's so much humidity in the building and it's trapped inside there. And that's all, that's the sort of thing, even in the domestic situation. <coughs> Then we're looking at uh, under dry rot, Cerulean lacrimans. This is considered by many to be the more deleterious problem that you can have with fungal decay, because you don't actually need a, a moisture source right where you're seeing the decay. Mycelium, the roots from the fungus can travel. Two, three meters is not unusual, and to go through a 450 thick solid brick wall again <coughs> isn't unusual. So you might come across a dry rot problem in one house, but the cause can be next door. It's come through the party wall. Yeah, so it can get through in a lot of places. Atwood times, the timber can appear to be dry. If you've got things like painted skirting boards, you can have a nice smooth skirting board up there. Press it and effectively it's just a paint reinforced or dust reinforced paint skin on the outside is, is all you've got here. That isn't cloth, that is timber panelling on a wall, which is very much affected by it. It's how it shrinks the timber behind it. And then when you see the other aspects, lifting up floors or when your foot goes through it, it's that crumbly, desiccated timber. And I said in here, you've got a paint skin of a skirting board with the remains of the, the timber hung onto the back of it. An early sign of this can be sort of when you're seeing um, almost a sort of a veneer coming up, you know, coming forward. And I said, don't nasty think of where you see the dry rot, that is the source of it. You've got to go searching for it, and it can be some distance away. And if you really do get to the heart of it, when it really, really is wet, in a nice muggy cellar, under, under, under an unvented floorboard, you'll get the nice big rubbery, multicolored fruiting bodies under there, you know, sort of there. Oh, you know, quite psychedelic in their colours at times. Uh, so again, unventilated air spaces. Dry rot is traditionally known as cellar rot, because that's where so often you get it, in cellars to the underside of ground floors. Warm, a lot of humidity, and very little air circulation. And so that is what you get, get in that sort of high humidity area. And you need to maintain that for it to keep going. It doesn't like fresh air. It doesn't like ventilation. And more above anything else, it doesn't like sunlight. It doesn't like sort of ultraviolet light. The wrong one. The other form of damp in buildings can be dismissed. I've touched on this already. And that's why we're getting mold coming in. A mold growth. Because if you're getting mold, you've got damp. You're not getting, again, one without the other. So that is a, 
an aspect of damp. So often seen, as in the bottom one here, in a kitchen area, heavy mold on the ceiling. That's the inside of a, of a flat roof. A kitchen extension up the back. And uh, yeah, an unventilated flat roof. Bituminous felt on the top, no insulation, cold effort, no ventilation in the kitchen, no extraction, the windows aren't open, air bricks are taped up, and so that is the sort of thing that can occur. Plasterboard, unless it's foiled back, is going to be vapour permeable, and so you can probably assume that the roof deck, or the underside of the roof deck above that, is going to be pretty wet. It's going to be trapping that moisture that's going up through the ceiling. The one above there, different picture, it, it's not the same roof. Uh, again, classic, so-called breathable roof felt, which isn't totally breathable. It's permeable. And again, this is the classic thing here where you've got, in a fairly modern house, the insulation has been hard tucked down into the eaves. So you've got no cross-flow ventilation. Very typical of a lot of homeowners, they're being told, make sure you've got lots of insulation up there so that you know, the, you're saving heat inside. What they tend to do then is they go up, put their head through the hatch, and they've got a draft. And they immediately assume that because they've got a draft, you know, they're losing heat because it's all being wafted away. The insulation is, should be keeping the, the air in. So to avoid the draft, they shove it into the eaves. That stops the crossflow ventilation. Fiberglass mineral wall, whatever you want to do, it's still vapour permeable along with the ceiling boards. Moisture go vapour goes up through there, cools, condenses, even on the so-called breathable papers, and you start getting mould mold build up. And again, mold is a symptom of damp. So if you're seeing that, again, you know you have potential damp problems in that area. And so that can then start causing other problems. And one of the things we're coming in here, it also almost runs on from this morning's discussion about fixings. Uh, if you're looking at a prefabricated truss on a modern type house, and again, modern architect back <coughs> into the 1950s, and particularly if you've got the sort of the uh, metal plate connectors on there, if you're seeing mould like that, check those plate connectors for corrosion, because there's more and more problems now because of this, of corrosion in plate connectors on trusses. So once you get those start to fail, you've got a big problem with the roof. So again, it's knock-on it's knock on problems that you're seeing from a simple thing as, you know, you can see mould as a symptom, but what are you getting on from that? And then the other thing, there are a lot of claims now coming, and particularly if you're dealing with flats, social housing, that's a rented accommodation where you're getting mould, there is generally big concerns about, from occupants about what's it doing to their health. And so if you get to something to that extent, if they're bold they're putting their head in the roof and they see that, what's the landlord going to do when he starts getting environmental health knocking on the door saying, you've got a damp house? So it is, that, again, it's a symptom which can lead to other problems in this whole thing. So mould, as I say, cold surface, poorly ventilated spaces where water can condense. Once you get that forming, you, that's giving a a ground on which all the yeast, all the spores that are in the air around us now can start to germinate and they can spread and you'll get the symptoms of black, black or green mould kind of, or in grey mould. Typically cellars, ceiling voids, over bathrooms, kitchens, whatever, anywhere it's not adequately ventilated and you've got a cold surface it can condense on. Uh, as I said, where you've got ceilings on the upper floor under the eaves, you'll, you can often find you know, the black mould growth along under the ceiling in that position, head of the walls, where again, water's run down the <coughs> side of the felt and the roof, saturates the insulation that's actually round into the eaves gap, 
that causes a, an extra cold spot, so you're getting low class condensation and mold spread inside the uh, room itself. And then whilst we're talking about damp, insects have a big effect. Death watch beetle, this one, it generally isn't a problem. But that this morning, when you've got nice hard green oak softwood, you won't get this beetle into it. But if you get a nice piece of good hard old oak or green oak, once you get fungal decay into that timber, then you might find that this little chap isn't too far behind. Fungal decay in timbers, particularly the uh, hardwoods, changes the composition of the timber severely. It converts a lot of the tannins in the timbers into sugars, into starches, as well as softening the timber itself, but particularly those, those starches, these things love. They'll eat on them and they find it easy to bore through. So if you are dealing with a property and you come across indications of a death watch beetle, uh, uh, and that you're generally told by the hole size, which it's only, what, um, two to three millimetres. Then if you've got that side of hole, then you've got another problem coming on. It's an indicator species. So it could well be that you've got historic heart rot within a timber if you're in an old property. Uh, if you are seeing it on newer properties in newer roof spaces, which are apparently sound, then you've got water coming in somewhere, uh, softening the timber and allowing these beetles to get going. And so again, <coughs> it's one of those things which uh, you need to watch out for. And as I said, it is, it is also the hole side that's important. That two to three millimeter hole is uh, that's watch. If you're coming across the, sort of the pinhead type hole, in what would have been the sapwood of old timbers, old oaks, elms, whatever, in a roof space or in floor beams, that is generally because th that probably occurred in the 20, 30 years after those timbers were converted and incorporated into the building, because that's when it's generally into the, the sapwood that is left on the squaring up of the timbers, uh, which is nice and soft, nice and full of starch, and so they've gone into it at an early stage. And so they've nibbled away and gnawed away at that stuff. They get to the hard core, the hard and tannin-rich material. It's too hard, it's too bitter for them, and that's the point sort of where that colony would generally die out. So, yeah, that is the problem. Other parts, the country, particularly if you're up and around the Surrey Heaths, verging over and now spreading slightly more down over towards um, sort of the Surrey Hills area, you can get sort of the bigger daddy of that, which is going to leave your hole about five to six mil in diameter, and that's the post longhorn beetle. Very localised effect, I'm, you know, so I've not put the picture on that one. But again, you're looking there at an insect, whereas against that one is what, about five to six millimetres long. Post longhorn is getting on for 12 millimetres long. And it, it is a big chunky thing. And when you get the holes like that, you certainly will know it. You can, you can stick a bar over in the hole. And so, uh, but again, very localised. And if you're in those areas, you'll probably find you've also got, if you're doing new work, you've, you, you've got constraints administered by building regs as to how timbers are treated. And the other thing about these, the Death Watch, it, like a lot of uh, the other boring beetles, they are very much humidity and temperature dependent on when they mate. They want to say nice and warm, say nice and humid before they emerge. And that's assuming they do emerge because they can stay in timbers. So again, it limits the effectiveness of surface treatment of timbers when you're looking at that aspect. You got other indicator species you tend to, tend to be ignored. You know the common insects. Oh, we get earwigs, slugs, millipedes, earthworms. 
And again, all indicators are damp. It depends on where you are in the building, where you will find them. Uh, you, you can, if you've got things like defective valley gutters and a roof, eat, you know, but water's coming down through the tip, you can even find earthworms you know, at first and second floor level, where they've been introduced as spores, as eggs by, from birds into the area, or even air blown into it. And if you get water entry in, they're following that species in. And they are all decaying. Uh, they are go all going after decay timber. That's what they do in the wild. That's what they do outside in the countryside. They break down timber. And so <coughs> if you're seeing any of these species, again, it's an indication you've got some damp in there. And again, they are indicators. They are not the source of the damp. You, know, you hear people say, oh, we've got earwigs in our cottage. How do we get rid of them? Get rid of the damp first, and then they'll go. So, and again, so when you come to the basic detection, you know, as, a, as a simple building surveyor, and I'm afraid you know, it, it, it is a little bit um, uh, male orientated in the model there, but, uh, so I apologize for that. <laughs> Uh, sense of smell, most fungi have some form of smell, depending on how well the property is ventilated, you may or may not be able to detect it. It's very, it can smell anything from a general dry mustiness, it can smell like very ripe mushrooms, decaying fruit, very much depending on, on the situation, the type of things. Uh, you, some fruiting bodies, if in a very close, you know, you will, it almost sounds like bad drains. And, and there are other things. Normal touch, what does it feel like? What does the, the surface feel like? What you're, you, you know, you actually get down and uh, feel what it's like. The site, how is it looking? If you actually are seeing big mold growth of some form, that's a pretty good indicator crumbling and breaking away skirting, skirting boards or pelmets or whatever, window frames, a good indicator. What can be a useful one, and particularly where people have been doing refurb and repair, is that aspect there of grinning grain. <coughs> go into a house, go into a property that's so-called been refurbished. They've pulled out all the old timbers, they've done, pulled out the skirting boards, and they've put the new, uh, you know, the new stuff in. They've got umpteen metres of wicks. They've shoved it onto the wall there, given it a kind of primer, undercoat, and a top coat. <coughs> and if you still have it active in the area, usually within about two to three years, you'll start to see knots particularly starting to grin through and then other graining in the paint surface. If, if it's a new, fairly thin paint surface, you'll start to see that actually start to grin through the surface. Come through almost sort of a, a gray brown, obvious staining into, in, in, into the timber and into the paint coating. So that can be an, indi an indication, particularly so if it is a sort of a refurb job that you're looking at. I'm going to go. <coughs> and then when you're walking over floors, if you're looking for the classic one, you know, what is it? Have you got any sign of decay in the, uh, of the suspended timber floor joist? It's the usual heel bounce and see how much movement you've got in. Sometimes you don't need that. Sometimes you can just walk across and everything on the shelves and every, every bit of furniture is rattling as you go along. Uh, the worst one is if you get onto the floor and it feels like you're walking on a waterbed. You know, it really starts to rock and it uh, You've probably come across things like that before as you've gone on. Enhanced detection in various ways, the technical assistance, the moisture meter, uh, which is that one there. The standard two probe uh, resistance meter, protein meter, there's all sorts. There are several types on the market now, but they all rely on the resistance you're getting between those two contacts. Uh, they, they're an indicator. Don't rely too much on because one of the other things you've got to consider on that is what surface contamination you've got in that particular room, in that particular area. If you're going into a, 
a house that's been unoccupied for two, three months, middle of winter, <coughs> hasn't had the heating on, how much local surface condensation have you got when you shove it into the skirting boards? If you look at an older type property, and again, let's say pre-1960, pre have you got lead primers on, you know, under the timber? Lead undercoats, <coughs> because they will all help to give you a very high reading on those probes. Uh, again, if you stick it into a wall, again, be aware of those. Have you got um, wallpaper that's got a metallic paint in it or a metal metallic film in it? And where you are in the country can also uh, affect that in respect of what and how conductive is the aggregate that's in the plaster. If you're in, if you're in certain parts of the West Country or up through in the central area of the country, up, up through in the Midlands, and you're using uh, an aggregate in there which, which has got a magnesium-based sand in there or a magnesium-based aggregate, some of the uh, other crushed rocks, that can give you a high reading because they are a lot more conductive than uh, you know, other, other materials. Mm. Sample testing is where you'd use something like the speedy meter, or the, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, the acetylene measurement and that sort of thing, where you're taking a sample. Usually it's a brick dust, drill into the wall, take a sample of dust, put it in there, uh, put a lump of carbide in with it, that's going to convert that into, a, in, into acetylene gas, that's going to measure the pressure and so that will give you a reading of that. Very good, very good accurate meet readings, but if you're doing a standard house survey, that's classed as intrusive. You know, to come in with the drill, you know, to so take it out of somebody's wall, again, you can't do it at, at an early stage, so again, the other way to do it now is to look at some of the newer devices, thermal imaging, the thermal camera, as to what you're seeing. You know, the warmer the reading, the brighter the colours and the colder otherwise. Uh, this, this was a damp in a wall in a small office. You've got, re oops, sorry, wrong way, wrong way. You've got a relative heat source there you know, with a uh, photocopier printer. And this is a plaster board on Dab's wall. And you can see how much damp behind that plaster board is coming in by that relative darkness in that area which extends right there on the face of the wall. So again, yes, it's showing you what's behind. But as with all these devices, you need a degree of interpretation as to what you are seeing and what you are getting up from the various readings. So don't just say, right, <coughs> with, so with the speed in me, so with that one, stip it in, I've got a high reading, that means I've got damp. You know, so really be circumspect. And even with this one, this will take a degree of interpretation as to really what you're seeing as a ha and as to where you're pointing the, ca the camera or the lens you know, of your device. Uh, a small thermal camera, now is about 450 quid. You can also get, now get a, a, um, an adaptation to go onto s smartphones for about half that. So you know, the devices are coming down in price considerably. Where to start? Uh, yeah, look around. What's obvious? And you know, with the problems that you're encountering with this, uh, high ground levels. Is it penetrating damp? is interstitial damp. In this particular case, we've got a high ground level behind that wall, uh, which rises up to about 600 above the internal floor level. So that gives us a good clue as to what we've got in there. But again, it could be as easy to d distinguish that with uh, interstitial condensation. Obvious defects, is the damp coming down? Is it coming up? Is it blowing in through the walls? exposure of the buildings, defective guttering, uh, rendered surfaces, these can all cause problems. Then you've got the obvious problems, uh, 
blocked outlets, stamp pipes, broken, internal leaks, all those types of things in there. And then they've got the more obvious, uh, sorry, less obvious features, and that is sealed ex external faces <coughs> where you're causing problems. Uh, not all that clear, but this is a, a white masonry painted wall using a modern plastic polymer type base paint. It's on uh, traditional brickwork behind it, but you've got great big water <coughs> blisters in the surface. And that's where it's a solid wall construction. The basic fabric is uh, vapor permeable. Vapor, vapor moisture out, moves through the wall, gets to the outside face, it can't evaporate and so it condenses directly behind the face of, the, of that plastic skin. And so there you've got a distinct water you know, entrapment within the fabric itself, and that's going to come back into the building, you know, giving other problems. Uh, well, on the roof, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, failed roof coverings, you can all spot that. Uh, the other ones could be less obvious, you've really got to get up close to them, very often in awkward areas, that's where you get displaced and defective flashings. This one here, you've got a complete sort of cover flashing, it's just fallen right out the wall, and so that, that, that damp pipe from a higher roof there, it's discharging water down and just running straight <coughs> down underneath that in, uh, in, into the uh, roof void below. And then this is an example of roof space, uh, sorry, <coughs> roof, place in, roof space insulation displacement. And that's where it's being tucked in. You're getting saturated insulation in the wall above. So you've got, so you've, you've got damp on the wall head there, damp in the ceiling in the bedroom. And the insulation above that is actually saturated. So it's no defect in the building, in the building fabric, it's just purely defective in the way the insulation has been placed in that area. Normal things with gutterings and downpipes. This is one you come across occasionally. It's where someone's, someone's at some point shoved a chimney up there at the bottom of a roof valley. <laughs> and, you know, they expect the roof to drain properly. And so, you know, it... Uh, you know, it doesn't really work work at all well in that position, and so it's sort of, a lot of damp comes right way down through that stack internally because, because of that. Other defective gutters, you've all, again, you've all come across these before. They're all problems. There's the obvious one there of the blocked down pipe, you know, with the blocked half ahead, cracked down pipe itself. And then you have your gutter put in like that sitting 200 mil off the, you know, from the eaves, you know, it's highly effective, isn't it? You know, it's a, so, uh, and then also often undersized guttering, particularly on older type properties. You know, you know the, people think there's sort of the standard 100 mil half round section will drain any amount of roof space. You know, just uh, and it, if it's not catching it, it's then it's coming down, it's running down the walls. And then you get other ancillary things, such as this one here. This is looking down over the top of a, of a balustrade on the front of a building, and you've got plant growth growing up through it. You've got plants, <coughs> plants need moisture. So you've got plants growing, there's moisture in the fabric. So again, it's another indicator. <coughs> Uh, in this case, it's a whole combination of things. You know, we've lost the pointing along there. The pointing between the, the terracotta balustrade has gone here. And so all that water's getting into the head of the wall. And that's coming down through the building. It's showing it's damp inside. And it's, it, it's affecting the ends of the ceiling joists and the roof trusses where they run back underneath that parapet in that position. High ground level is a fairly obvious one, which, you know, you should be able to spot. And you'll get condensation as well. Condensation can come from 
uh, high ground levels, and we'll touch on this again in a minute, where even you have walls that have been tanked. Nice clean plaster there, and you can see where it's being tanked along. There's a nice, almost a sort of straight line of where the damp comes up through to there. Tanked internally, but the basic fabric behind that tanking is going to be wet because the soil is still up against it on the outside. All you've got there is a, a dense waterproofed cement backing render to here, with a, you know, with a coat of um, pink gypsum over the top of it. Yes, it's holding back the moisture, shove your resistance meter in there and you won't get a reading. But that wall behind is still cold. And so in an area such as that, close to the window, in a position like that, you're getting chronic condensation on the inside of the house. And it's all too easy then to say, right, we've got that, and therefore the, the tanking's failed. No, the tanking hasn't failed, the tanking is doing its job. It's just that the remedial work wasn't appropriate in this position. And again, here, you've got another piece of wall up against here. This is distinctly condensation because of where it is positioned in the corner of the building, low ground levels outside, very closed airspace, little air circulation around it, and so you're getting localised condensation, but is being blamed on rising damp and sort of high ground level externally. Bridged damp courses or um, oh, bridged plinth courses in earlier buildings, again, can cause problems. Again, much the same sort of thing. Here you've got a combination of uh, hard cement up render over a, timber, uh, over a timber wall plate over the top of a brick and rubble plinth course. That's sucking water up through capillary action behind the render. Also, it's entrapping moisture in behind it so the wall can't breathe, and so you're getting exacerbated, ex exacerbated down problems in timber. Again, more problems with external coatings. Hard cement renders over timber frames. Uh, you'll get obvious thing, as in this case, it was a building outside, looked like a 19th century rendered large building, but had very regular cracking within the render. Took the render off, and where all the cracking was, we had the primary timber frame in the building. When that came off, uh, that timber, when it came off, was about the colour of these seats here. Saturated. You know, because it's all being trapped behind there. And also, because that amount of dampness trapped in behind there, the, the whole of the render had blown. And that's why it's so, it came off so, so readily in that particular case. When you're looking at modern plastic coatings, the, the spray coatings, we all insulate your house with six millimetres of solid plastic. Uh, that's all the problems you can occur, you see occurring here. So much condensation and so much dampness entrapped in that building. You've got condensation occurring on the outside face of the building, which should be warm, where this 16th, timber, 16th century timber framing, it must be absolutely sopping inside that's cold, and th therefore that's causing localised condensation on the outside. And that inappropriate um, materials being used as that render in that case, because it's so vapour impermeable, the walls just can't breathe, everything's trapped inside it. And then again we came back to the same sort of thing, around the base here, the plinth wall here, and the plinth wall here. It's supposed to be drying zones in traditional housing, all covered with hard cement, impervious material, and so the water just can't dry, get out. So anything that does come up through the base, always capillary action, can't dry to the outside face, it's being trapped inside, <coughs> and is affecting the timber, and the timber framing that's in, that's in behind that. Uh, again, more aspects of that. Uh, the uh, <coughs> coatings aren't just hard renders, they can be hard cement pointing, which can exacerbate it, because Mortar joints traditionally in a traditional building should be considered as a sacrificial element on the outside pointing. 
and it doesn't let them breathe properly and then when you get the modern plastic paints over that that is again we've seen the problems earlier that that's causing it from there this the upper picture here is again two three coat hard cement build up over a timber frame building causing a lot of problems this is an infrared of uh well, as you can see, it's, it, it, it's a downstairs loo, which in itself has got problems because it's got very little ventilation in it, uh, very little heating as well. But here, the amount of co uh, coldness in the wall you have there through a combination of hard cement re render with plastic masonry paint on the outside, just in trapping moisture into that whole of the fabric. So the whole of that room is cooled right down. And again, you can see the difference between the toilet paper and the wall itself. So it just shows you how cold that you know that that wall is. Yeah. Even you know, even even, even the <coughs> basin to the uh, WC bowl is warmer than the than the wall itself. So that's uh, a lot of moisture trapped within that whole fabric. So basically, what prob you know a, a quick little thing here. Uh, explain interstitial condensation. It's where with a wall, you have a temperature on one side and in, in, inside the room. As with all basic physics back to school days, warmer the air, the more moisture vapor will hold. So if you have a warm, warm room inside and a cold area outside, you'll have less vapor out here than you will there. And if this is a theoretical wall of theoretical uniform consistency material, you'll get a thermal gradient as the air goes through it, much as that. So that when it gets at some point towards the outside, it will hit a dew point where that moisture vapour will condense. And providing it doesn't have an impervious coating on the outside, that moisture will then be wicked away by air movement. Much the same as if it rains on it without that coating, it will dry back to the outer face wall once the weather improves. And so, at this stage, let's assume that we have a dew point which is just behind the, the moisture, uh, the outside coating here, where that finally condenses. But what then happens is that as that more, as, as more and more moisture passes through the wall, there's more and more moisture being collected in behind this impervious render. And so this part of the wall, because it's wet, it becomes cool, virtue is the outside temperature then. And so when that cools, the dew point moves inside. And that is a steadily progressive. So you can end up with the dew point on the inside face of the wall and a totally saturated wall core which then leads to problems that we saw just now with saturated timbers, big bubbles of water behind the paint on the outside. And if you're looking inside, depending on where you're looking inside, you're going to see problems. You're going to start to see decaying timber skirting boards because they're damp. If you take a picture of a wall, even in the middle of the summer, you'll find a big black mold patch behind it because you've got a localized piece of condensation behind there. And so it all these factors are tra trapping moisture in the, in the fabric, which is causing damp in timber. And so it's, again, it's understanding the mechanics of, of, of how, the, you know, the, how the, the whole thing is working. So that's with the walls. When we look at timber floors, timber construction, uh, as I said, you should all, I expect you are all used to dealing with movement in timber floors, how sound they are, how they're doing. And that level of flexion will reflect mostly on how good the bearings are into the wall. If with some old houses, even on upper floors, it can, it can come down to timber joist size or span, which can give you flexion. But particularly on the lower floors, ground floors, that's where you've got to be more suspicious of timber decay. With the bearing ends into the wall itself are direct wet related decay or fungal decay in, into corners and that's something where there's inadequate ventilation. So it's a case of checking out for air vents in the base of walls, how clear they are, 
how adequate they are. And again, also check the relative position of where they are in the wall. Because you can end up the situation where the actual air vent that you see is above floor level. And so that will depend on what you are looking at. Are you looking at, in fact, a vented cavity rather than, uh, than an underfloor vent? So again, just think needs to be uh, thought about for a bit there. And then we looked at uh, high, high ground levels against a suspended floor, which again, is going to totally muck up your uh, ventilation into that floor because you aren't going to have cross-flow ventilation in that direction because there's a wall and there's higher ground level and so that can cause a problem and if you have problems then with a road or something on the outside space what is that doing for introduction of water into the base of the wall and potentially into the floor void you know through through road drainage is um highways authorities don't like you digging up their pavements and putting a french drain along the edge of the house i don't know why but uh, it seems and uh, then when you're looking at that, also then consider, consider cellars. This one was a particularly interesting one because uh, in this situation, it was a cellar under a house and uh, it was all in sort of rubble stone. That is uh, where the past occupant tried to insert the floor by just putting some slab polystyrene up underneath the floor joist which had all fallen down. But the main problem with this particular house was just there, and there's another one just there which you can't quite see. Those are both air bricks to ventilate the under, underfloor space. But the trouble was they were positioned uh, on the edge of the road outside and due to the road camber, all the water was coming down the road and flowing straight into that cellar, and so they had a sump pit with an electronic pump in the cellar. Rather than try and put some crank vents in there, they were, they were happy to pump the, pump the cellar out. But so, uh, uh, and that was then causing a great deal because then the water was evaporating up through the whole of the house from the cellar to get out. And so, you know, the whole house again was damp through uh, other problems. Air circulation, again, <coughs> another panelling problem here. That again is, uh, that again is uh, dry rot affected timber panelling. It's not, it's not a sheet of paper. It's where you've got uh, panelling up against a solid wall base, inadequate ventilation behind that, and there's dry rot, in that case, coming up from the cellar below into that particular space. Restricted spaces, again, we're coming back to block eaves level, and that, that sort of problem we've harped on about before. So again, it's needing to get that air circulation back into the house, or if, if it's being closed up, get it back in. Otherwise, you're looking at to provide new ventilation wherever possible into these types of areas. And that can be problematical, because it's, it's the way of working. If you're getting something like this, overgrowth, then it's getting someone in there with a big pair of shears and loppers and getting all that stuff off of the building because that's all holding moisture into the fabric. Similarly, if you can imagine, oops, go back down, sorry, wrong button. These, this is uh, in the winter, so if you can imagine all these trees in full leaf in the middle of the year, that again is going to upset the ventilation around the whole of the house. It's holding moisture into that house. And so again, that is giving a general ventilation problem to, you know, to the whole of the fabric because if it's moist outside, it's going to be moist inside because the whole humidity level has gone up by the general environment that, that you're in in that position. Uh, weather, yes. Uh, we, we've had a bit of that in the last few days and we've, uh, some we've had quite a bit of weather, different sort. And shouldn't necessarily be ruled out as to intermittent problems with damp in timbers and as to what you're seeing. Wind direction can be a particular and problematical uh, difficulty. Temperature, again, condensation, 
and the wider aspects of climate change as to the suitability, the durability of the materials that we've got in most construction, most houses now, modern and old, is how durable they are. And then we have you know, the general erosion of material through climate, where it's distorting of weatherboarding, cladding failures, or whatever. Before I get away from that aspect there of wind direction, just to use this one as an example. This is a property up in the Chilterns, uh, which had stood there for what, uh, 400 odd years, quite happily. And then over one winter, they suddenly were getting a lot of damp coming into the, pro into the building from the outside. Not so much at ground floor level, but this is coming in at first floor level. The roof was good condition, the guttering all worked well, didn't need cleaning out. What it was that had a particular number of storms over the winter which had come in from the northwest as against from the southwest. So the wind had gone round. So then when we looked at the wall that was being affected by the change of wind direction over this one particular winter, we found that as a lot of timber frame houses, that one had just cantered over very slightly. And so what was happening was that the water was running down the frames, hitting the, the cross members, and being channeled right into the building. And so again, weather change, and it was so, uh, the way we got around that was that, uh, oh, the timbers here, in a couple of places where the there was a lot of timber exposed, and the panels had moved slightly. You know, we had, I said a lot of timber there, 25, 30 metres of top edge of timber exposed. In those cases, it was a case of overdressing those with a lead flashing, just cutting into the brickwork above, dropped down over that, so that was fully waterproof, and that ran down from there. Where we didn't have that, it was a very careful raking out of all around all the timbers, inserting a pre compressed sealant strip uh, just into a, into a um, and uh, it was going to about a, about a three four millimeter gap pre-compressed strip and then pointing that up on the outside with a flexible lime mortar mix which is lime mortar with a tallow which is waterproofing and reasonably flexible at the same time and so what that gave that gave a dressing to the front edge of the sealant strip gave it uv protection and then once inside that strip, over the next 24 hours, that expanded up and formed a, a very tight uh, compressed joint. And so we were then sealing the joints in a way which maintained the character, which is acceptable to the conservation officer, and it sealed against dampers, damp, and in fact, also sealed against air ingress at the same time. So we improved the thermal efficiency of the brickwork and the fabric very slightly in doing so. So again, Weather is a factor which has got to be taken into account. Insect attack, as like I said, this is generally residual. But again, look at it as far, as far as damp goes. Uh, so yes, you, you, know, you know what that looks like inside. So when you're looking at, as I said before, flight holes, check the size of the flight hole, where they are, give yourself an indication of what, what sort of beetle they are, and whether that is going to suggest you have a damp problem within those timbers. This is the inside of a thatched roof. And it's a very traditional pole rafter roof, a mi mixture of larch and ash poles. Dating, this one is probably uh, very late 18th or, or early 19th century. But because it is all in round pole. There isn't very much sap, uh, sorry, not very much heartwood in at all. You're looking at poles, 75 to 100 mil diameter at most. Of that, you've probably got a good 25 millimeters around the outside of that as sapwood, which the uh, ordinary woodworm, known in punctatum, likes. What then happens is that these will snap after a while, which is 
not an unusual occurrence. You, you've got some quite big breaks here. They, yeah, and that's it. With a thatch, because thatch is a very flexible material, that will then start to come in. That will belly in in itself. That, in turn, starts to pull the thatch. Because the roof slope has deformed, you know, the thatch weave extends. That opens up the thatch, and that then starts to allow a greater risk of water penetration in through the body of the thatch. So again, it's, and then that, in turn, when that gets in, that speeds up, you know, sort of the decay in this by then introducing an element of wet rot alongside any decayed timber you, you have in here. So again, it's that symptom and, uh, and effect that, that we're seeing right the way through here. Whereas in the other one, it is, yes, when you do have death watch, just, just listen, listen for the tap. The death watch tap will be usually within about 48, 36 hours of emergence, because that's when the males are looking for a mate. So, and again, that is humid and temperature de de determined. And you'll find it end of May, beginning of June, and then end of August into September, that sort of thing. You'll, you'll just get the little yeah, usually at night when it's nice and comfortable and dark. And if you've got them in an area, that's where the damp is. Because death watch beetle males don't fly. So if you locate where they're tapping, that's where you've got the decay, that's where you've got the damp, that's where you need to treat it. Uh, and when you look at in enhanced insect <coughs> uh, detection, that's a normal sort of thing. Uh, it's the paper penetration test. You put it down, stick a piece of paper over an affected area and see how many new holes you get punched through it. Pheromone traps, moisture meters on this case determine uh, the cause, cause of dry. UV traps on this, in this aspect as well. What I, what I should have put on there is the other one you can use are the um, uh, core testing devices where you have the pressure probe, you push it through in through a timber and that measures the uh, timber resistance and if you have got a hollow core it suddenly jumps forward and that shows up a little graph and uh, gives you an indication of what the material is like behind the outer face. Uh, so compound problem exercise. This is and it still is. I think it, it, it looks a bit smarter now than it did there. Uh, late 17th century house in Hertfordshire, in a, what we now class as an urban, situa uh, urban situation, uh, being boarded up about 20 years. Because of that, keeping out squatters, that's why it's been boarded up. Uh, no long term maintenance, or no recent maintenance, I should say, in it at all, apart from real, real first aid stuff really was uh, usually to go back in and secure after the squatters have been in there and uh, that was the limit of maintenance. The lead, lead had gone years ago and you had these uh, signs up all around the building trying to deter further entry into the property and you had vapour permeable, impermeable wall renders on three sides. And you probably recognise some of these pictures I've shown already today. And this was the results inside. Dry rot running from cellar right up through to first floor level. And then this one here is a good example of death watch beetle attack to the end of a beam. That's at second floor level, uh, under, under the end of uh, part of a parapet gutter where the lead had gone. And so that's the level of decay that you've got in there. You've, you've got a timber which has gone from about, it's, it, it was probably about 250 by 350 wide and deep to a bearing end there which is about, about 100 by 75. And that's carrying a major part of the roof in that particular situation. And so that is the sort of problem that you can get through you know, poor, damp problems. So what you do about it 
If you've got rising damp, then the obvious thing is try and correct it. Lower the adjacent ground levels where you can. Make sure the damp proof courses aren't bridged. And uh, yeah, introduce a French drain if you're able to. Get, get the ground level down and around it. And also remove surface splashing. You know, where you've got defective gutters and whatever, taps, whatever. They can all give you problems. Where you've got uh, plinth courses, bases, make sure they are breathable, that they can be used, and they work well. Get rid of any bituminous paint on those surfaces, because this is, should be where the wall is breathing at the base. <coughs> they can be decorative, but most often, you know, they, that's a later addition. And if you are then someone saying, oh, well, I want to put a new damp proof course in there or inject one in there. BRE, Building the Research Establishment, showed that back, right back in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, from the research they were doing then on a whole number and types of um, damp proof systems that were, people were introducing at those days with the 30 year guarantees. Um, whatever they were offering at that time. Bialri found then that most of the problems to resolve damp in walls and into the fabric of a house generally, rather than inject or in replace a damp proof course, can be corrected by normal remedial action. So that you've got to do a certain amount of work to install an injected damp proof course or to cut a new damp proof course in. So by the time you've done all that necessary corrective work, you've probably overcome about 90% of the problems that are causing damp. So again, question you know, sort of whether a new inserted damp proof course is necessary. We still come across building society surveyors who will look at a house and say, there's a slate damp proof course. You know, I want a new one put in, I want a new one injected. But why? If a slate damp proof course is, is working there properly, it's not bridged it should function just as well as anything else. Their argument is, yes, but slate is a brittle material. As the building moves, it will crack. Yes, you might get a micro crack in a three-layer slate or two-layer slate, something like that. But it, you know, the amount of moisture that's going to allow it through is going to be minimal compared with the, you know, the potential costs and damage of what you're doing, you're doing to a historic fabric anyway. So, Again, usually just reduce the ground course, ground level around it, and it's more than adequate. Uh, usual thing, you know, gutters, damp pipes, getting the damp out of the building is the usual thing, just to make sure it's probably overhauled, properly ventilated, it's there, uh, and you don't have the problems. Flashings are some, another problem. Particularly, you can just about make it out in this one. The parapets and chimneys, you still see it where they are made up with a, with a haunch mortar fillet. Inherently a brittle material, got no tensile strength, any slight movement, shrinkage, and you get a failure. So, you know, so that in this particular building around there is where you're going to get a problem. You've got a lead one coming on that side, great. I would always recommend any anything on a house like that replacement with lead. You know, work to lead sheet association details and you, you know, just specify them and it's, uh, it's fine. And if you're doing any detailing on that lead sheet, lead sheet association, now have a beautiful line of online um, drawing details or corrected details for uh, all sorts of flashings and copings and other works like that. And then it's the usual thing. This is general upkeep. You know, Plants on the top of walls, parapets, where old buildings, old sections of roof have been removed, where you've got embedded timbers which are then getting sufficiently soft to allow root growth into them. That's all the problem. So uh, get those sorted out. Then we've got penetrative damp, damp. ensure that coping flashings there and mortars are all up together. And again, where possible, check whether it is penetrative <coughs> damp or whether it's saturated interstitial condensation type damp. So check the style of the pointing and the raking at outside. Uh, we've dealt with the impervious coating as a way that they can entrap moisture. If you've got plastic paints, consider them having removed. Use a DOF 
system or something like that, get them blasted off back, doing too much damage to the underlying fabric. And then it verges to the roof. So often when they're re-roofing, roofers love saving a couple of cores of the slate. So if they can finish a roof, the verge, smack on the head of the wall, they love it. That will just drip down on the head of the wall, which causes damp. Uh, you're, the first thing will disappear, if it hasn't already disappeared, is the barge board and any rafter, any, any um, verge rafter that's around there. They'll rot out. And they get repaired to the other services, make sure they're there. Uh, so remove plastic coatings if you can, just check them all out for uh, permeability and get them as vapour permeable as possible on these whole buildings. Uh, with chemical treatments for damp tr in timbers, more and more clients are now becoming concerned about what they are using or what's going into the houses. You know, there's a lot more awareness about it. Um, there's also a knock-on effect on depending on where you are and what you're doing. Uh, if you're into roof spaces, do you need to get a protected roof inspection, uh, sorry, protected roost inspection? Have you got bats, have you got other creatures up in your roof spaces? Because there's some big fines now that's necessary on that. <coughs> and then adjoining owners are becoming very susceptible about what their neighbour's do in the roof. If they're smelling chemicals in their house, you know, they can get a lot of problems from that. So again, consider any form of treatment very, very carefully as to the impact they're going to have, not just on the property you're dealing with, but on adjoining properties and the wider environment around you. Uh, yeah, environmental control will work. The problem is if, if you can dry something out so the fungus becomes initially inert, most of them will die off after about 20 years. The problem is persuading clients, particularly corporate clients, like, we'll repair it, but we won't do any timber repairs, and we'll leave it for at least 20 years and see, see if it comes back again. It doesn't always get a good reception. You know, but it, it, it can work. Uh, and so again, good maintenance, good temperature treatments. Temperature treatment as well, uh, is one method that some firms have been are promoting. That's where you effectively empty a property out, wrap it in bubble wrap, and you try and bring the whole temperature inside the building right, right up, and you kill anything off because of that with the high temperature riser. But there's a lot of work involved, a lot of disruption, and uh, you know they've shown it in smaller museum buildings where you can do that, but. Imagine trying to do it with a place this size. Impossible. It's, uh, but it, you know, it might be something which will develop over time uh, to be viable. Uh, but generally, there's a lot of information about it. A lot of clients do get frightened by, you say, oh, you've got decay, you've got fungus, you've got mould. And they, for, 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 you know, first of all, they say, how much is it going to cost us? How bad is it? Is it going to collapse? And it's knowing what you're talking about, it's talking them through the particular problems and how it can be addressed. It's, as I say, good communication on all this aspect. Any questions? I've got to visit a very two listed building tomorrow that's had a flood, so can I speak to you? Is that really on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Just yeah. give me some pointers of what I should be looking for. Well, if, yeah. if, if it's a flood, yeah. if it's a flood in many ways, that's not so bad. You know, if, if, if it's a regular flood, then you know, there is a problem. But if, if it's, if it's, if it's a, a local, it's, it's a one-off type flood, then there it's a case, probably just a case of getting the building dried out and, and how it's done. I've got um, in there at the moment, yeah. put in by the loss adjuster, whether that's a good idea or not, I don't know. And, uh, well, very often the yeah. best way is just to open all the doors and windows, let the air, yeah. air run through it. Because if you, you, that's the other thing we get. <coughs> people go into a house and they say, oh, we've got mould, we've got, we've got damp in the house, we've got this, that, and that. We've bought a dehumidifier 
and look how much water it's producing a day. And then he's saying, right, okay, um, is the room sealed? Oh no, it's in our sitting room. We're in it all the time. And I said, that for you, you're, you're trying to dehumidify the whole of the house. And every time you open the window, you're, you're dehumidifying the whole of the country around you. <laughs> yeah, so if you've got a dehumidifier, yeah, put it in the room, tape up all the doors, tape up all the windows, and you'll get the, you'll get the, the moisture down that, in that area. You'll get the superficial moisture out. To get it, anything that's soaked into the floor or into the walls, you know, that's got to work back out again. So if it's going in under two foot of static water pressure, it's going to take a long time to come out. Yeah, and yeah, the dehumidifier will just dry it out, but it's, it's then, yeah, give yourself another 18 months and the house might be dry. Can we just say one more? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the, okay. the high, high ground level, you yeah. heard that the tanking was working, but there was still damp coming through. What would an appropriate remedial work be for something like that? No, the damp isn't coming through. The wall is still damp. Hmm. Uh, and so it, it has answered the requirement of the building society when the man came along, shoved his electric twig in there, he gave a high reading, he said, needs, needs damp proofing. They came along, damp proofed it, goes back in, it's dry. So the wall's dry as far as the inspector goes. But you, know, you have this problem with condensation. You'll have the same problem if you, if you try and tank a cellar. If you've got, see, I've got one, I've got a high water table, you'll still have saturated fabric behind that. If you're not ventilating the cellar properly, You'll see the decorations failing, particularly around the base of the wall, we get very high condensation levels because air moves in a circular movement. So you've got a static air pocket all around the base of the walls and around the, because the air <coughs> sweeps around in the Brownian motion like that, it doesn't go into the corners and down. So you get a static air pocket, which is much of what's happening in there, trapped by the curtains when you pull that back, base of the wall as well. So it is a condensation problem. So ventilation. Good ventilation and, 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 and good heating. Open the doors, open the windows, and uh, that's it. Trickle, trickle vents and that type of thing. Yeah.